Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. And um, my name is Roshan O'Neill. And on behalf of um, Queen's University Belfast, the Association for the Study of Obesity, NI, and the Division of Health Psychology, NI, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this webinar on um, digital technologies and weight management. Um, we have a great lineup of wonderful speakers this morning, and we really hope that you enjoy. Um, you'll see from the agenda that we're not having questions directly after each um, speaker, but we'll have a panel discussion at the end. And we ask that you um, just add any questions that you have throughout the webinar um, to either the Q&A box at the bottom of the, uh, the, the um, panel or the chat function, and we'll discuss those during the panel session. We um, have fingers crossed for no technical glitches, but in this virtual environment, we can never say never. Um, so we ask for your patience if we do. Um, and if you do get um, thrown out of the webinar, you can just follow the, um, the link back that as to how you've got on this morning. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over um, to Dr. Laura McGowan, um, who's going to give you an overview of the Division of Health Psychology NI. So I hope that you all enjoy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Digital Technologies and Weight Management. Uh, this webinar today has been brought to you by the Association for the Study of Obesity Northern Ireland Network and also the Division of Health Psychology uh, Northern Ireland uh, and Queen's University Belfast in a joint symposium. As we go through the day, we'll use the hashtag ASOWebinarNI if you want to tweet anything about the day. So I really just wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about um, the Division of Health Psychology um, and specifically the health psychology section here in Northern Ireland, if you don't already know about us. Um, so the goal of health psychology is to study the psychological processes that underlie health and illness, um, health care, and then to apply these to the promotion and maintenance of health um, and also um, analysis and improvement of the healthcare system and health policies. Um, it's also relevant to the prevention of illness and disability and then to the enhancement of outcomes for those um, with illness or disability. So really the Division of Health Psychology's um, vision um, is to be uh, the public authoritative voice of health psychology and you may have noticed um, a little bit more about health psychology uh, in the news or in the media over the past uh, almost year or so given the, the COVID pandemic because we have had a number of eminent health psychologists who've been really quite involved throughout that. So here um, in Northern Ireland, we have our own regional branch, which is the Division of Health Psychology NI, um, and we put on a programme of events each year. Um, this year we have the Northern Ireland British Psychological Society Conference taking place um, in April online, and that's now open um, for submission of abstracts if anyone's interested. Um, we also have a, a careers event, which will be around um, understanding the different routes into and pathways around health psychology, um, and also hearing from inspiring health psychologists about their careers and how they've gotten into the discipline. That will be in June. Um, all of these will be online, and then we'll have a, a public engagement uh, lecture around September, October. Um, and you can keep up with any updates from our division using the Twitter handle there, um, at DHPNI. And then the main division of health psychology that's kind of based in England, um, has uh, their online conference as well at the end of June this year. And I'd really encourage anyone um, to, to take a look at that programme um, and again, to con consider submitting an abstract there now open and you can keep up with developments also using their Twitter hashtag. And just before I finish, I just wanted to mention the role that health psychology and indeed psychologists more widely have played throughout the coronavirus pandemic. And um, these are uh, resources that are available freely online and um, through the British Psychological Society, um, both for the public and indeed for professionals. And they've been really 
usefully put together by lots of cross-working groups um, of psychologists within the British Psychological Society. And I would really encourage you to, to go online and take a look either via the BPS link directly, or you can indeed access them um, through the Division of Health Psychology's resources uh, tab on their website. So thank you so much. We're delighted to be involved in hosting this uh, seminar along with the Association for the Study of Obesity. And Julia is gonna tell you more about that now. Hi, I'm Julia McClelland and I'm a PhD student at Queen's University Belfast and I'm the PhD representative for the Association for the Study of Obesity Northern Ireland Network. I just wanted to give you a brief overview about the ASO. So the ASO is the UK's foremost organisation dedicated to the understanding, prevention and treatment of obesity. It was founded in 1967 and was the first such organisation in the world. It is affiliated to the European ASO and the World Obesity Federation. They organized the first International Congress on Obesity in London in 1974 and the second European Congress on Obesity in Oxford in 1989. It is the founding body of the International Journal of Obesity and it has a board of trustees elected from the membership and they run for a term of three years. So the ASO mission. The ASO aims to develop an understanding of obesity through the pursuit of excellence in research and education, the facilitation of contact between individuals and organisations, and the promotion of action to prevent and treat obesity. So the ASO are involved in a number of activities, such as national, European and international conferences. They have 10 ASO networks throughout the UK who link researchers and practitioners in the field of obesity. They also have an early career network and host an annual ECR workshop. They are also involved in consultations and with the media and they provide expert input into policies and guidance. They also offer awards and grants to celebrate the best in obesity research and practice and most recently had a grant um, for COVID-19 research last year. They have 32 approved Centres for Obesity Management or COMS for short and you can apply and register to be part of the ASO network of tier two, tier three and tier four adult obesity services via the ASO website. So if you would like to become a member, full membership for the year is £60 and if you're a student it is £30. There are many benefits of joining the ASO, such as eligibility for ASO awards and grants, discounted journal subscriptions, the opportunity to promote relevant jobs and courses and events for free in the monthly e-newsletter. There's also reduced delegate fees at ASO conferences and training events, free attendance at ASO network events. And because they are affiliated to the European ASO and the World Obesity Federation, you would receive reduced delegate fees at EASO and World Obesity Federation congresses. There is also access to the members area of the ASO website and there's networking opportunities on the ASO Slack workspace. You would also have voting rights on the main policy issues of the ASO and opportunities to get involved and to collaborate. So the next conference is the European Congress on Obesity and that will take place on the 10th to 13th of May 2021 and it will be held online this year. Unfortunately, we have had to cancel UK Co. This was due to take place in Belfast in September. However, please look out for the ASO Twitter account for details on a regional event. Um, and these details are still to be confirmed. So I just wanted to mention a piece of research that we are conducting. It is a questionnaire on the experiences of having excess weight in today's society. The aim is to gain an understanding of the experiences of men and women who have ever had excess weight, such as if they've ever experienced weight stigma and in which situations. And it is also to determine if certain terminology to describe weight is preferred in different contexts, for example, in a healthcare setting or in the media. We would really appreciate it if you could share the link to the questionnaire on your social media pages. I will post the link into the chat box and it is completed anonymously. 
And if you have any queries, please get in touch on the Wait Survey email address. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's webinar. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, and thanks to Julia and Roisin so far for um, giving that uh, introduction. Um, so without further ado, we're going to kick off with our first speaker of the morning. So uh, we have Dr. Jean Walsh, who is the director of the M Health Research Group at NUI Galway. Um, and she's going to talk to us this morning about technology and healthcare, past, present and future. Now you won't see uh, Jane's uh, video thumbnail on this, you'll just see the slides, but Jane is here and, and will be uh, ready to answer questions. So please don't forget to pop them into the, the Q&A uh, as we go along. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jane Walsh. And today I'm here to provide an introduction to the area of digital health behaviour change with a specific focus on weight management. Just to give you a little background about myself, I work in NUI Galway as a health psychologist where I direct a research group on mobile technology and health. We work on a wide range of funded projects in the area of how technology can be used for health and specifically health behaviour. Just to give you a flavour of some of the projects that we're engaged in, we work on projects focused um, on personalised nutrition, also on reminding technologies for people with dementia, we conduct projects with a number of patient groups also. For example, we're working on a HRB funded project on the development of an adaptive mobile physical activity intervention for stroke survivors. And we recently completed an Irish Cancer Society project on how to increase physical activity in cancer survivors. And Jenny Groark is going to talk more about that later. Since the um, beginning of the COVID pandemic, we've also had a number of projects funded that look at how we can use technology to enhance our health outcomes. So one project is called Covigilant on contact tracing uh, using the app, and the other is to reduce stress in frontline workers, which of course we know is a huge problem at this moment during the third wave. One thing that's become crystal clear to us in the last 10 or so months is never has our behaviour or our use of technology been more important. We are um, looking at ways always to stay healthy and well whilst on lockdown, how to use technology um, to help us stay healthy and well. We're using it for information, to log and record things. We're using it to communicate with others so there's a heavy emphasis now on the importance of technology and how we can use it. So we're familiar with the term digital health and this encompasses a lot of different areas like mobile technology, gamification, the use of apps, sensors, wearables, and so on. If we weren't aware before, we're very aware now that technology is pervasive in all of our lives. It's everywhere and we really need it now um, during the pandemic. Specifically mobile technology or any type of portable devices. So we're all in possession of mobile phones and most of us smart watches and then many of us are using other devices also um, such as wearables. One of the consequences of the advent of mobile technology is all of the health apps, tracker devices and consequently many of us are becoming our own doctors where we're tracking our heart rate, our blood pressure, our calories, our step count. And um, this is something that's become very commonplace. We can see from how we're already using it and also where the future of this technology is going, that there's enormous opportunities to revolutionize healthcare using this type of technology. A lot of the work in psychology has been on the use of digital behavior change interventions or DCBIs. And they've been used in all kinds of formats, computer programs, websites, apps, wearables. Many of these we'd be familiar with already. But there's a lot of skepticism still around whether or not we can truly technologize healthcare. 
Now, I drafted this slide before the pandemic, and now we've realised that healthcare is being technologised, so is education, so is this very conference. Uh, it's something that I think is here to stay and will have an even firmer rooting in our lives going forward. So, scepticism is now reality. But this is not new. Both the World Health Organization and the European Commission have had a vision for many years, this is going back to 2016, that healthcare providers would be able to use apps and technology as a center vehicle for delivering healthcare. And when we look at the phased assessment for um, how this would be, a mobile devices and apps would be developed, we can see behavior change down below, which of course very relevant to us who work in the field of health psychology. Now we know this already, that health behavior is a key to a long and healthy life. And by health behavior, this is everything from smoking, binge drinking, um, healthy diet, uh, physical activity, hand washing, we're familiar with so many new ones now, uh, medication adherence, in all of these are classified as behaviours that are relevant to health. Some more risky and some are health promoting. But we know that behaviour change is complicated. So even with the best intentions, people can still struggle to implement their intentions to engage or change in health behaviour. So a psychological understanding of this is very important. And this is where our science has made big strides and we continue to contribute to the provision of healthcare. So lots of you will be familiar with Susan Mickey et al's model of health behaviour change. It's in popular use now, the COMB, where we say that to predict or understand behaviour, we need to understand the capability, motivation and opportunity of those engaging in it. And without understanding this, it's very difficult for us to develop an effective behaviour change intervention. Specifically, the active ingredients of any intervention we develop will be um, one or several of this BCT taxonomy, behaviour change techniques, of which there are many to choose from. And how we select which ones we use for each intervention depends on a pretty extensive review of the literature. Um, and these are then in turn implemented or embedded into mobile um, technology apps or interventions. Now there's at least half a million health apps on the market and the question is do they work as behaviour change interventions? Well as you can see underneath, hint no, they're rarely effective. The reason for this of course is that many of them were developed by app developers, technologists without an evidence base. And one of the really important ways to develop your evidence base is not just looking at the literature review, but it's also taking into account the opinions of stakeholders who have a key role in this particular health behaviour and its outcomes. So this lovely quote sums it up. If you miss the first buttonhole, you will not succeed in buttoning up your coat. So at the centre is a person. And when we um, design our behavior change interventions this way, we often refer to what's called a person-centered approach developed by Lucy Yardley et al, where we develop guiding principles. And these are coupled with extensive review of the literature and so on to inform our intervention design. Now, specifically in relation to the use of technology, psychology and weight management, well, we'd all be aware that the common target behaviours for weight management are dietary behaviour and sedentary behaviour. And just to outline uh, some of the work we've done in this area, uh, one of the studies we did was looking at personalised goals to reduce sedentary behaviour in bariatric surgery patients. So these are patients that were referred to uh, CRE, which is the um, heart charity in Galway to attend their CLAN programme, which is Changing Lifestyle Activity and Nutrition. And this programme was designed to help patients referred by the bariatric surgery um, consultant 
to try to teach lifestyle changes that would facilitate them in the longer term. The content of this program involved a full medical checkup, a physical activity class, and then a lot of educational workshops around healthy eating and physical activity, and then taking into account psychological issues and how to cope with psychological stress. In this study, we provided uh, participants with personalized goals where they could use their mobile device as a step count proxy, but also we gave them specific targets to move more and to try to increase their movement or reduce their sedentary time by 10%. So using a mobile device as a proxy tracker, people could keep some track of their motion. And what we found is that by using personalized goals, coupled with the use of mobile technology, we had a significant reduction in sedentary behavior and an increase in physical activity as measured by step count, but also in terms of just general movement. The key to this was the feedback and the personalized approach. But one of the things we noticed was the attendance was quite poor at the program. And this really highlights how the digital technology can be used as a vehicle for communication for those that cannot attend these programs. And this is something, of course, that's really pertinent at the moment. Uh, we also conducted a study uh, with cancer survivors who were living with overweight or obesity. And one of the targets of the health service was to try to help them adopt a healthy lifestyle for long-term good outcomes and reduce the possibility of cancer reoccurring. And so Jenny Grork is going to talk more about this particular study with you later. But just to say it also involved mobile technology, personalized goal setting and feedback. And these are key features in the success of an M Health intervention. So this program had very good results and Jenny will tell you more about those. So these are just some of the examples of how research in this area is, is being conducted currently. But what about the future? Well, because of the way technology is going, there's fantastic scope for highly personalized interventions. So we did uh, personalized interventions to an extent, but the scope for personalizing even more to fit around somebody's lifestyle, their preferences and so on, it exists already. And the way forward is to embed deeper psychological um, profiling and information and preferences about people into the technology to have very timely, pertinent um, prompts and feedback to really enhance people's uh, uptake of these changes in health behavior. So to truly develop state-of-the-art and um, digital behavior change interventions. The key is to merge stakeholder input, to take objective data from devices, sensors and other data, and to use all of this data to create an algorithm to deliver highly personalized interventions. So the person at the center has input in the style of the design. They have some control over the timing and the nature of prompts and feedback. And that's some way to track um, how they're doing in terms of adhering to the various uh, health behavior changes that are um, under study. It's very important also to take into account regulations on safety and privacy. And this is something that's quite a new area and ever changing and quite challenging for people researching in this area. So a perfect synergy is required between several disciplines with the person at the center of all design interventions. So going forward, evidence-based personalized solutions are key. And for these to work well, psychology plays a key role, but also working closely in a highly multidisciplinary team with technologists, medics, companies and industry, economists, and at the center of it all is the person or the patient under study. Teamwork makes the dream work. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much, Jane, for that uh, really nice overview um, in terms of where we're at with the technology and how it's integrating into um, healthcare and, as you said, uh, now more than ever. So up next, we have uh, Dr. Jenny Grork from Queen's University Belfast, although I think Jenny is talking about some work that she has undertaken uh, in NUI Galway uh, with Jane. And her talk is, uh, can digital technology support health behaviour change for those with overweight and obesity? And I just want to remind you, if you're tweeting, please use the ASO hashtag ASO webinar NI, and also please do post any questions at all to the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll keep those for the panel discussion. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me to speak at this event today. My name is Jenny Grork. I'm going to be talking about a recently completed research project um, and I'll describe the impact and acceptability of this digital health behaviour change intervention for cancer survivors with overweight and obesity. So to give an outline of the talk, I'm going to start by describing the design of the intervention, uh, followed by its effectiveness and its acceptability. This project was a collaboration between a research team at NUI Galway, led by Jane Walsh, who you will have already heard from today, and uh, Dr. Janice Richmond, leading the clinical team at Letterkenny University Hospital, and it was funded by the Irish Cancer Society. So I don't need to tell this audience that there is a growing number of adults with overweight and obesity. However, uh, the proportion of cancer survivors who are, have overweight and obesity is significantly larger, about half of cancer survivors have overweight. And this is of concern because high BMI, poor diet and lack of physical activity are all risk factors for cancer development. And in survivors, increase their risk of a secondary cancer or subsequent primary. So with these concerns in mind, along with the great potential offered by digital technologies to support behaviour change, we set about designing an intervention to improve health and well-being outcomes for this group of uh, participants, and in the main by increasing physical activity behaviour and improving diet. We adopted a theory-based approach to intervention development using the behaviour change wheel and the COMBI model at its core. We selected the most effective behaviour change techniques that we could find in the literature. And this complex intervention had two main components. The first was a lifestyle information and education session with a physiotherapist, dietitian and psychologist. And they used the behavior change techniques of information about the health consequences of behavior, instruction on how to perform these new behaviors, and the psychologist worked on problem solving and barrier identification to health behavior change. The second component then was a personalized goal setting intervention. And this involved increasing average daily step count using graded tasks, so a 10% increase each week and we offered feedback and review on their behaviours. And this particular aspect of the intervention was facilitated by mobile technologies. So specifically the Fitbit and text messaging. So the participant would wear the Fitbit physical activity monitor and this would send data about their step count to the app, which we could then access and review, add 10% and text a goal to the participant for the following week. So they would get a text something like this, your average daily step count last week was 2000, let's aim for 2200 this week. Then the following week, if they were successful, they would get a message saying congrats on reaching your step count goal, let's aim for another 10%. Um, if they didn't uh, reach their goal, they got a more neutral text message like the, the first one. Um, so we did use mobile te technology to deliver the goal setting intervention, but we also used it to objectively monitor physical activity in both arms of the trial. So the control group were wearing a more simple model of the Fitbit as well. Um, our sample was um, on average 57 years old, uh, but it was predominantly women and predominantly women with breast cancer. And on average, they were six years post diagnosis. 
So moving on to effectiveness then. Um, we found a significant interaction effect for BMI. So the intervention group um, had significantly lower BMI than the control group at baseline in spite of randomization, but they also had significantly lower um, BMI at three month and six month follow up. But where the interaction effect is, is in the reduction of BMI. So this was a significant reduction in the intervention group, um, but there was no change in the control group. And importantly, the BMI reduction was maintained at the six month follow up. We also found a, an effect for waist circumference. So there was a significant reduction in waist circumference in both groups, and this was maintained at follow up. However, the, the interaction was that the um, magnitude of loss was significantly greater in the intervention group relative to the control group. Um, we didn't find any impact of the intervention on functional exercise capacity measured by the six minute walk test or on any of our psychological health and well-being outcomes. And instead, we found there was significant improvement in both arms of the trial. Um, moving on then to health behaviour outcomes. Um, similarly, we didn't find any impact of the intervention on dietary behaviour. Um, both control and intervention participants improved their diet over the six month period. However, we did find some significant effects on, um, uh, on physical activity measured using the Fitbit. So um, these asterisks here are representing significant group differences. So as you can see, there are quite a few throughout the, um, the goal setting intervention. And you can see the intervention group are more frequently um, hitting above that 10,000 steps a day mark. And what's interesting is we actually also found that some of these um, improvements or increases in physical activity were maintained after the intervention ended. So um, during the follow up period. So in terms of effectiveness, this um, complex intervention with a once off lifestyle information and education session, along with an eight week goal setting intervention led to a significant reduction in BMI and waist circumference and a significant increase in physical activity. So um, after that 24 week follow up, we invited all the participants in the intervention to be interviewed about their experience of the intervention. We were interested in looking at um, some of the constructs from this theoretical framework of acceptability of healthcare interventions. Um, so we interviewed 13 uh, participants that were broadly representative of the intervention group as a whole. And we found that in general, um, all participants had a, a mostly positive attitude towards the intervention as a whole, but the M Health or the digital health components were um, rated particularly positively. So some people went as far as to say they loved their Fitbit, others um, treating it like a little toy. Um, now the attitudes towards the text messaging support were a bit more mixed. So these two women in particular felt that the messages were implying that they weren't trying hard enough and that they weren't doing enough, they could, you could do better. Um, and so they felt angry and irritated as a result. But for others, the text messages were described as a source of comfort. You know, someone is there for you, someone's taking care, for, care of you, or um, you, you haven't just been dumped. And they liked the idea that they were being monitored, that somebody was, was watching over them. We also asked participants about how they thought the intervention worked and, and what did they understand the aim of the program to be. Um, so for us, um, a, a very important aim was to improve health and, um, a, a, and a key outcome was BMI or weight management. Um, and it was interesting that actually very few, only five participants referred to weight management in their responses and instead took a more holistic view of health, you know, the eating better, living healthier, mental health, um, as well as much broader aims like um, moving forward, getting my life back, feeling like myself again, which of course are very relevant in the context of cancer survivorship. Um, and this ties into some of the benefits and effects that they reported. Um, 
So almost all of them reported physical health and, and improvements in their fitness and their mental health and well-being. So while we, we didn't find strong evidence for that in the quantitative analysis, it is nice to have these qualitative reports showing that, uh, that people did feel um, an improvement in their health and well-being. You know, this woman says, um, I feel I'm on the way back out of this tunnel. And they also talked about some outcomes that we didn't measure as part of the trial. So they reported changes in their self-confidence and their self-image and, and kind of their identity. So coming back to the, who they used to look like and who they used to be. Um, and in terms of the support that they, they found most helpful in increasing their confidence to change their behavior, it was these text message reminders. So this digital aspect of the intervention seemed to be beneficial. Um, findings were pretty mixed and reports were mixed in regard to how much of a burden it was to participate in the, in the intervention, but there was um, a lot of consistency in that um, dietary behaviour change was seen as being the most dis difficult aspect of the intervention. And again, we didn't see effects or, or a, change, a significant effect of the intervention on dietary behaviour. And this led us to think that, you know, maybe a future iteration of the intervention might um, usefully include some kind of digital behavioral support for dietary behavior change, something like um, weekly dietary goals. Um, and also there was um, a good sense of uh, cohesion in terms of most people found that physical activity increase while easier was much more time consuming. So um, from our qualitative investigation, we concluded that the intervention um, was acceptable to our participants because of it, the coherence of responses with the theoretical framework of acceptability. So that was reassuring. So to finish up, um, our takeaway message is that this digital health behavior change intervention significantly reduced BMI waist circumference and increased physical activity. So there's some support for the effectiveness of this intervention. But it's consistent with an emerging body of research on digital interventions with cancer survivors um, that have found that they tend to have limited impact on diet and well-being. And I think um, looking clo more closely at the design of the study, there were no aspects of the digital intervention um, that deliberately targeted well-being outcomes. So perhaps um, a more expansive intervention that um, uses digital support to try to increase and improve dietary behavior in addition to um, other aspects of well-being. Um, it's also supporting existing work that digital interventions do seem to be acceptable to cancer survivors and more broadly accepted, acceptable to more general populations. And so for those reasons, we should continue research to evaluate and refine digital health behavior change interventions to try to improve outcomes because we have this growing number of cancer survivors and a growing number of those with overweight and obesity. And so um, digital interventions do seem to have potential to support um, health positive behavior change that may improve health outcomes. Um, but we still have questions um, remaining about the feasibility of these kind of interventions um, scaling up, but also in modern oncology practice or in other healthcare settings. So just to finish, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak and thank you to our funders, our participants and all our collaborators. And if you'd like to get in touch with me or ask any further questions about that, um, those, that series of studies, please contact me. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, another really, really interesting talk. And I think um, you're absolutely right. The um, collating of evidence around these digital behaviour change interventions is crucial because we know they're going to form such a big part um, from here on in. So next up, we have uh, Professor Michelle McKinley uh, from the Centre for Public Health at Queen's University Belfast. And Michelle is going to talk to us about 
also um, an automated text message intervention to support weight loss after pregnancy. And this is the Supporting Mums Pilot RCT. Okay, thank you. Don't forget to add questions uh, and use the hashtag for any tweets. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to Laura, Roisin and Julia for the opportunity to contribute to this webinar. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Supporting Mums pilot RCT. So this was a fully automated text message intervention to support weight loss after pregnancy. First of all, a little bit of background. Uh, women have an increased risk of weight gain during the childbearing years and many women talk about pregnancy as a time that set them on an upward weight trajectory um, for the decades ahead. We know that established predictors of long-term obesity for women are gaining too much weight during pregnancy, which is known as excessive gestational weight gain, um, and retaining weight uh, after pregnancy, so postpartum weight retention. And around one in four women will have substantial postpartum weight retention at one year. So this means about one in four women will retain about nine to 11 pounds of their pregnancy weight one year after they've had the baby. The postpartum period is a really opportune time for lifestyle interventions and there are several reasons for this. So the postpartum period is often referred to um, the, as the interpregnancy period uh, because it can be the preconception period for subsequent pregnancies. So intervening at this time means there's a chance to influence future pregnancies um, as well. Women often have new motivations around health um, just because of a heightened awareness of their own health and that of their babies. And importantly, there's the potential to influence the mother's health, but also the wider family's health um, by any changes that uh, the woman may make at this time. But we also have to be very aware of the challenges that the postpartum period brings and there's a lot of qualitative research out there um, describing the experiences of women in the postpartum period um, and this slide really depicts the chaos that can ensue at that time um, and you know women's lives certainly are changed in many ways one of the major changes is that their own health is very often the last thing that they consider on the list after they've taken care of everybody else. So there are unique challenges to intervening um, with regard to lifestyle changes at this life stage. And it's logical then to think that what works for weight management at for other groups in the population may not work so well for postpartum women and we need to bear that in mind when we are developing interventions for them. And we see the challenges of this in some of the previous trials um, around postpartum weight management in the literature. This is just one example. It's the Active Mothers Postpartum Study that was published in 2009. And it was quite a large study in America, 450 women with overweight or obesity um, who were enrolled at six weeks postpartum. And the aim was to promote a reduction in BMI uh, via sustainable lifestyle changes. So the intervention was quite intense. Um, eight healthy eating classes, 10 physical activity classes, six telephone counselling sessions delivered over a nine month period. And what we saw in this study um, was there was no significant difference in mean weight loss between the groups. In fact, on average, the intervention group gained approximately one kilogram during the follow-up period and the control group gained approximately 0.4 of a kilogram during the follow-up. And one of the main conclusions uh, by the authors of this paper was that the results indicate that community delivered interventions delivered outside the home are not likely to affect postpartum weight loss and more individualized programs delivered in home via telephone mail or internet or emails and via um, digital methods may be more feasible and potentially more successful. And following this study in 2009, um, a few years later, a systematic review was published on this topic in 2013. And this was published around the time we were conceiving the Supporting Mums uh, study. 
And this systematic review looked at the uh, effect of lifestyle interventions on postpartum weight retention. And one of their conclusions was that interventions that have used modern technologies have shown promise in their capacity to limit postpartum weight retention. So again, indicating that uh, possibly the use of technology with this population group may be particularly uh, beneficial or attractive given the challenges and barriers they face to lifestyle change at this stage. So based on this uh, information in the literature, we considered the approach we wanted to use in the Supporting Mom study and we decided on text messages for a number of reasons. Um, and they're, they're summarized on this slide. So text messages are really an any place, any time sort of intervention. So they don't need women to be in a certain place at a certain time to receive the intervention. And clearly that's attractive when you're thinking of um, dealing with a postpartum audience um, for whom leaving the house requires many hours of preparation. Um, it's a simple mode of communication. So no matter what type of mobile phone you have, the most basic function is that it can send and receive text messages. So it's attractive from a health inequalities perspective. We know that text messages have been used to change other health behaviours like smoking cessation in the text to stop trial and importantly for um, lifestyle behaviour change interventions, text messages have the ability to be proactive as well as reactive. Um, so you can set the messages up to arrive at certain times of the day um, and it also can incorporate the function where women can reply to text messages or you can incorporate interactivity and tailoring if you want. Text message interventions also allow sustained contact over the longer term, important for any lifestyle behaviour change. And um, alongside that, they're also relatively low cost. So when, it, when you come to thinking about scaling them up or implementation at a population level, that's an important consideration that they are potentially low cost and lend themselves to that. So based on this, the Supporting Mom study was devised um, and the pilot um, randomised control trial was really um, conducted to test the text message intervention, to test recruitment of women and retention in the study to see if the intervention was acceptable and to see if there were indicative effects on weight loss and provide a decision on whether we should proceed to a full trial to test effectiveness of the intervention. I'm not going to go through all the detail on this slide, but it just summarises the intervention components um, for the intervention group. But in summary, we spent a year working with women to develop a library of text messages. Um, the text messages focused on diet and physical activity, and they addressed barriers that are specific to this group. And we embedded behaviour change techniques known to be important for uh, lifestyle behaviour change and weight management within the messages. We included some interactive features, so trigger words, exhausted, bad day, crave and slip up that women could text at any time and receive an automated response. We also um, had yes, no text messages that we sent, so that had a yes, no type question within it and women then were asked to reply to that. And we asked women to report their weight weekly via text message as a way of encouraging self-monitoring. The frequency of the messages you'll see on the right hand side of the slide varied um, from 14 to 15 in the first eight weeks of the intervention and that tapered down to four to five weeks in the last six months of the intervention. The first six months of messages focused very much on weight loss and the second six months focused uh, changed focus to focus more on, on weight loss maintenance. So we recruited 100 women um, who were within two years of having a baby over 18 years old and had a BMI that was over 25. And we randomised women to the intervention group to receive messages about weight management or to the active control group who received messages about childcare and development. And we followed women up every three months during the 12 month intervention. This slide just summarises the study participants. So on average, the age was 32.5. 61% of women were on maternity leave when they were recruited um, and 42% were first-time mums. 
we did our study assessment visits um, in the women's home, or at least we offered that to women as a way of um, encouraging retention in the study. Um, because just like the intervention, we didn't want women to have to come to your particular um, you know, setting in the university for the study assessments because that would be a barrier to participation in the research. And 91% of the data collection visits were conducted um, at home. So that was really important for retaining women within the study. The results then um, for weight change at 12 months are shown on this slide. And what you can see is the intervention group lost on average 1.75 kilograms and the control group gained on average 0.2 kilograms. So there was an indicative effect of the intervention on weight loss. We also looked at the proportion of women who gained a substantial amount of weight, so gaining more than five kilograms, because this is something that's very specific to the postpartum period where we know that um, a proportion of women um, are prone to weight gain during um, those first few years postpartum. We found that 8% of the intervention group gained more than five kilograms, but this was much higher in the control group. So in the control group, 20% gained more than five kilograms. So an indication that maybe the intervention is working not just to support weight loss, but also to prevent further weight gain um, in the women. One of the benefits of using technologies when you're delivering interventions is the ability to examine engagement with the intervention in different ways. And because we had two-way interactive text messages, we could monitor response to those to see how many women were using that uh, particular aspect of the intervention. So we looked at the number of replies we had to the rate texts and the number of replies we had to the yes no question texts. And on the basis of that, we calculated a measure of engagement. So we calculated the percentage of replies received from each woman. Um, and those who had sent uh, a percentage of replies above the median were classified as high engagers. And those who had a percentage of replies below the median were classified as low engagers. So just a very broad classification to allow us to look at engagement. We then looked at the change in weight and waist circumference according to whether women were classified as a high or a low engager, and this is women from the intervention group. And what we found was that those who had a higher level of engagement with the two-way text messages lost more weight, about two kilograms more, and had a larger reduction in waist circumference compared to those who were low engagers. Now the the women in the intervention group who were low engagers in terms of these measures still lost weight and still reduced their waist circumference, but that was certainly greater um, for those who were high engagers. And when we looked at replies to our weight texts and our yes no texts, we were able to see that um, women were engaging with that feature for the full 12 months of the intervention. So in conclusion, the Supporting Mums study was a fully automated text message intervention with two-way messages and feedback provided through interactive features. The pilot RCT demonstrated positive indicative effects of the intervention on weight management and participants in the intervention group who had a high level of engagement with the two-way messages experienced greater weight loss compared to those who were classified as low engagers. Engagement with the messages, the two-way messages, was sustained over the 12 months, and this is really encouraging, um, given the potential for sustained long-term uh, contact with participants, which is conducive to maintenance of behaviour change. And the next step for us is to secure funding um, to conduct a full trial to examine the effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of the supporting mums intervention. So I'd just like to thank the wider study team from Queen's, um, as well as our collaborators from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the University of Stirling, University of Dundee and University of Glasgow and the funders, the um, NIHR and Public Health Agency. Thank you very much for listening and I am very happy to take questions if time allows. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for that really, really interesting talk about the sort of meticulous and, and uh, very detailed development of the Supporting Mums pilot study. So um, before we break, we are due to have a short break and we will do that, but we really wanted to share with you before that um, a video, a short video from one of our um, a sort of patient perspective on on this issue and this video integral to have those views as part of throughout the day to turn their cameras on so that you can see them all uh, you might want to just keep your mics muted unless you're directly responding to a question in case of any feedback um thank you here they all are I'm, I'm delighted to say that we've had over almost 70 people sort of in and out um over the whole morning so i think it's been a really interesting topic twitter's been going crazy um with a lot of support for all of your talks so i'm going to hand over now i just wanted to say before i do hand over to roisin to chair the the discussion a huge thank you again to all our speakers and indeed to roisin behind the scenes and Julia behind the scenes who have helped to organize the very smooth running so far of today's webinar. So thank you so much to you both um, and uh, all our speakers. So over to you, Roisin. Thanks, Laura. And thank you everyone for excellent presentations. Um, so we've um, 12 minutes um, and we have um, lots of chat and lots of discussion, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work my way through the questions um, for our specific speakers, and then um, we can talk about just some of the comments to get your, your thoughts and views um, if we have time. So um, the first question was for Dr. Walsh. It was from Louise Tully, and um, it uh, is around, so um, it says, thank you so much for a really interesting overview. I am thinking about the long-term maintenance of in-health interventions, given the nature of technology um, as it's constantly evolving and updating. Do you have any insight on how this could be achieved or have you seen any economic evaluations of um, health interventions that take this into account? Um, so any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so it's a really good question. And especially after hearing Jerry's story, it's a lifelong thing, really. It's not short term. But of course, a lot of this research, it's either done by students, finite time period, funded projects, finite time period. So there's not usually the capacity to follow people up long term. And it's a really important um, question. So one of the things that I would say from what we've learned um, in psychology in general, whether it's the technology or not, is that people change, their goals and motivations change, their life changes. So what you need is something that adapts with them. So one of the things I mentioned was about the just-in-time adaptive intervention. That's like a lesson for life. So take something, for example, where uh, simple, where you're going for maybe physical activity increases, personalizing upwards. What do we do to help ourselves? We usually try to, to set some sort of a goal as uh, something that gives us a focus. Uh, it's like an end point. So take, say, couch to 5K. Some people think, well, once I've done the 5K, that's it, it's over. But what you're on there is a journey. And I think where a lot of interventions um, or programs fall down, is they don't sort of think about the next steps, what happened next, an easy transition onto a new goal, whether it's staying steady at the habits you've developed or sort of uh, pivoting or creating a slightly different way to go so that the, it keeps people's interest, it keeps their attention, it keeps them um, motivated. And people themselves usually know if something captures their eye, where they go next. So all of this can be incorporated, embedded into technology, um, they, one diet might work for a while, for example, but then it's not working anymore. So shift that fit in with lifestyle. And one thing that's come up a lot in the conversation um, today, and it's really valuable, is the person, the personalized element. So if people feel that this has been tailored to them, that they're being listened to, that it's something that they can fit into their lifestyle, if they're doing shift work, that they change accordingly, that it's not this inflexible thing where they're destined to fail, then I think long term you'll see very good effects. But that's challenging for healthcare professionals that have a sort of fixed quota uh, of, of advice and they sort of get stuck in the rut of the same advice. Um, and this is where digital technology can actually adapt by taking into account people's movements, sensors that sort of see when things are shifting, that recognizes the person at the center of this. Sorry for the long answer, but I think that the digital technology can actually help us all understand what the individual is doing, how they've changed, 
what they might need to fill in gaps. And we can have algorithms that can make helpful suggestions then. So I think that's the future really. And that will help us look at the long-term thing. Excellent, thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, well, we'll go to then um, uh, our, oh, our next um, question was from William Maxwell. Um, excuse me, I'm going to check the glitches. Um, so um, William has asked then, um, have we any evidence of the difference in acceptability of uptake in different settings for such approaches? Um, we have some evidence uh, that uh, did not attend um, is reducing for some services that have moved at, um, to digital delivery, um, particularly for those in rural areas who struggle to attend um, physical services. So any thoughts around that um, and the acceptability in different settings? No. Hi, Roisin. Do you want me to to? Um, I, I think this might have been in relation to the um, cancer survivors. Maybe um, particularly that question came up. Uh, but I, I suppose just a general comment. I think during the pandemic, we've seen um, how useful digital technologies have been, and a lot of healthcare has been delivered as we are doing now, or just over the phone. Um, and particularly for people who would maybe have to travel long distances to regional centres for their medical appointments or to see a health professional. I think we're really seeing the benefit of technology. And, you know, I, I don't think technology is necessarily for everyone. I don't think everyone loves technology to the same extent. But I think we have so many different technological approaches now that we can see them being used to support people in different ways, depending on what suits that individual. Um, you know, and we've heard about so many different types of technology, you know, from the chatbots to the text messages, to the apps, to, you know, the wearable sensors that we have. So I think that the, the pandemic in terms of healthcare and from a healthcare perspective has really highlighted how we can make more use of technology to engage with patients when it suits them, I think, you know, for some people, they're very happy with the digital interaction. Other people really want the face to face and to see a health professional from time to time. So I don't think we're ever going to replace that human contact that we all seek and we all want. Um, but really, I think what we're seeing is that a lot of these um, digital ways of communication can be really supportive. And that's been a key thread running throughout the conversation. And something that we saw in the supporting mum study in, in the feedback we received is that, you know, women said, even though we knew it was an automated intervention, we felt there was someone at the other end, we felt there was someone supporting us at a time whenever, you know, once you have the baby, all the focus is on the baby and the mums are forgotten about. Um, but really, you know, in the qualitative work that came through very strongly that they just felt it was lovely to be supportive and have something that was for them. And, you know, that was designed for them with care over the tone of the messages and that they were designed not to induce feelings of guilt to recognize that weight loss is, you know, it's, it's never just one direction. It's, you know, you have some success, you have some relapse, life gets in the way. So I think that that's come through is that technology can be really supportive to individuals. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's where it shows promise as well as that broader reach, not just into rural communities, but to people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And I think that's where we have to be careful as well is that we don't widen health inequalities um, through the use of technology that we're trying to make sure that, um, you know, if we are finding technology is beneficial, that it's available to all. Yeah, really good point as well. Um, thanks, Michelle. And definitely it, it is another thread is the personalization and the flexibility um, for, um, for individuals to choose. Um, so next uh, was a question for Jenny and it was from Catherine Cullen. Um, so Jenny, did you get feedback on a weekly basis from cancer survivors on BMI and did you set weekly goals for this? 
did you follow up women at one year post trial specifically if BMI reductions were maintained? So an interesting question about weight maintenance. Um, yeah, so I think Jane, uh, I'll, I'll answer the second part of the question first. I think Jane kind of touched on it in her response that um, unfortunately projects end and we would have loved to have followed up. Um, we, were, we were intending to seek more funding to, to, to do an 18 month follow-up to see if any effects were maintained, but um, it, it, just didn't, it just didn't happen. Um, of course, we were really curious and actually it was even a bit of a stretch for us within the context of our, of our, of our budget to try to do a six month follow-up. So we were, <laughs> we were kind of pushing the boat out on that. So, a 12 month or an 18 month follow up would have been um, an ideal scenario, um, of course, because weight maintenance would be, you know, a, a very important outcome for us as well. Um, so unfortunately, no, um, is the answer to that question, Catherine. Um, and the first question, did we get feedback on a weekly basis from cancer survivors on BMI? And did we set weekly goals for this? Um, no. So our weekly goals were in reference to health behavior. So our goals were about trying to increase physical activity gradually over um, a 12 week period. And the BMI reduction was one of a number of health outcomes we were interested in. But um, clearly that it was an outcome for us, but clearly it wasn't a major outcome for the participants who didn't really see uh, weight reduction as a, as, a, as a big outcome of the study for them. They were much more interested in kind of broader outcomes like being healthier, being fitter, um, getting my life back, moving on from cancer. Um, so the weekly goals are really in relation to step count and BMI was measured um, at baseline three months and six months. So it wasn't something that people, people were continuously tracking um, themselves and it wasn't something we were continuously tracking either. Um, and I'm not sure that maybe that might not have been very helpful um, in hindsight either um so i hope that answers that question thank you just like to add to jenny's point actually i think that was one of the the nice features of of the study was that the focus wasn't on weight i mean that's a happy outcome we really focused on people doing something positive for themselves um, and the feel-good factor around moving and strength and fitness because as you know as you build fitness or muscle it doesn't always show on the scales, but you can feel it a little bit in the waistline and so on. So we wanted more of that feeling strong and healthy as a focus. But we were watching weight because the goal for the HSE was that this was a risk factor for secondary um, cancer. So we wanted them to do that, but we didn't want people up and down on scales, you know, looking at those numbers. We wanted them looking at how many extra steps they were doing. So that was a feature. And in the feedback we got, they liked that. And of course, they're very pleased to see the way it was coming off. So it was a, a nice way of doing it. And, and I think a lot of research should think about less focus on weight and more on the positive behaviours that result in very positive empowerment and, and good feelings. And then the weight comes off um, as a result. So, yeah, lifestyle intervention rather than focus on mm -hmm. weight. Um, well, um, for the purposes of time, we'll, we've one one more question, um, and it's from Donna um, Gallagher, and it's around. Just bear with me; it's on my um, technologies. Yeah. Or do you have um, Donna yeah. in about yes. motivation okay. and? Um, yeah. So I think that Donla had said that it's been it's really challenging to create something where we can kind of um, support people or uh, build upon motivation, I think was the key point, because um, it's really difficult. Um, I think Karen's video outlined that really, really clearly. Um, so I wondered if anyone had any views on, um, you know, how we can deliver these kind of automated interventions, but that can help to support or in help increase motivation, but without stigmatizing or making uh, a sense of failure um, come out if someone isn't finding it easy to engage. And I think it is a really tricky balance to strike. Fiona? 
Yeah, I mean, just building on Jane's point about personalization, I think that this is a key. Um, I think often in weight interventions, and particularly because research funding is quite short term, you know, we we tend to recruit a, a, a body of people um, and kind of strain them towards that intervention. But really, we should be looking at things like their weight history and screening for harms like eating disorders and, and so on. Um, and, and actually then, you know, so tailoring and personalizing it in a much more refined way, not, not just about their preferences or messages or technology, but actually their entire history. And I think that's probably a little bit missing from current research, you know, kind of focusing on that as well. And, um, yeah, um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Absolutely, just I mean, some very, very good points I mentioned already. I don't want to, don't want to repeat those again. But I mean, technology is a supportive tool. Yes, we're going to use that different ways, motivational. And bear in mind, we, we need to consider the individual. And there's a diverse range of technologies available. And there's a lot more being developed. And there's a lot more coming onto the, to the market than will be. Um, but the point is, already mentioned, there needs need to be evidence-based, but also need to be suitable for the individual. And it's what works for, what, what technology works for one person may not work for another person. So it's really important that to think about the, the person, thinking about the individual, what works for them, what is the support, is the word key is support. What is the support for the individual? What works for them? What is suitable for them? What's accessible for them? But also as well, we want to try and inclusive inclusivity. The key is inclusivity. Try and basically, you know, what is best for the individuals? So basically, no one technology fits all. We want to look see what's what is we want to use a range of technologies to try and include a, as many people as possible, see what works for them, but to support them at where they are to make their healthy weight at where they are. So the key is get them to their healthy weight. And that is really does change from individual to individual. So that is actually really, really important as well. Well, um, Dr. Head, I think on that note, um, I think it's a really lovely summary. Um, and I just, for the purposes of time, I'm sure you're all busy. Um, we will um, end the webinar um, there. I want to thank um, all our speakers. Um, I think that we could very easily um, spend another hour talking about this. Um, it, they were fantastic talks and um, it's very evident that there is a lot of excellent research going on um, in the area. Um, I want to also um, just thank the audience for their um, participation and questions and um, the AOC um, office and the Division of Health Psychology NI for their support. Um, so on that note, I'll just bring the webinar to an end and say thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks all. Thank Bye. You. Thanks Bye. very much. Take care. <laughs>